New Orleans has the Saints. Steelers fans remember the immaculate reception. When you throw a desperation pass, it's called a Hail Mary. It's hard to avoid religious terms when you're talking about football, and in some ways, the language emphasizes the links between faith and the game. More than 35% of NFL players say they're evangelical Christians. That's 10 points higher than the nation at large. And Christian filmmakers often use the sport as the setting for their movies, as Adam Holtz well knows. Why? Are there elements in the sport that echo Christianity, or do we Christians just like football? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> right? faith, faith, family, football, right? right? <laughs> exactly. Alliteration, three points. It's a Baptist <laughs> sermon right there. There you go. There you go. And while we're talking about Christian movies, we'll talk about the latest God's Not Dead film out this weekend as a Fathom event. It's called God's Not Dead in God We Trust. And this time, Reverend David Hill, the franchise's central character, is running for Congress. We're going to be tackling all these topics and much, much more on this episode of The Plugged In Show. I'm Paul Acey, your host for this week, and joining me are two of Plugged In's most rabid football fans. Ooh, didn't get my shots. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Holtz, of course, <laughs> and unfortunately, Raiders fan, Brett Oh, Raiders. <laughs> Hello. Hey, guys. Although, I must say, to derail us immediately... I may soon be forced to become a San Francisco fan. Oh, Ooh, my and goodness. that's going to be super weird. Yeah, because Man, you're moving up I'm that moving. way. But I'm still going to be on the show, so you'll you'll still yeah. hear from me occasionally. Yeah, we, we couldn't rip him away from the show. No. So, yeah, is that going to be really hard? Well, I mean, they have, they have Brock Purdy. Yeah. He's an Iowa yep. State 49ers. guy. Yeah. And yep. they have somebody else. Christian. Who's, Christian athlete as well. Yeah, Christian and uh, the tight end, not Kelsey. Kittle. George Kittle. Kittle. Thank you. Christian McCaffrey. Iowa. Look at that. So, They've got a good yeah. team. Yeah. I do think they're going to be a little bit better than the Broncos this year. Well, we're going to find out. I agree with that Right sentiment. now? <laughs> <laughs> but already, we really have gone totally out. Yes, there. yes. Paul, so, back to you. Back to me. Yeah. Let's start with the icebreaker. Not that we need one. No, ice has been shattered uh, already, already, I think. <laughs> the ice has been shattered. But I, this question, again, is primarily for Brett, because <sighs> being the Raiders fan that he is, I want to know what it's is never going to stop, Brett. <laughs> never, never, ever. I'm used to it. What is your saddest, most heartbreaking sports memory oh. when you considered selling all your jerseys and becoming a fan of another team? And let me just open this up and say it doesn't have to be football. It doesn't have to be professional football. Just your most heartbreaking sports memory. Well, it is football for me uh, as, as a Raider fan. Just starting off on just a really positive, lovely note. Yeah, I try. Uh, the icebreaker. Uh, so I have two, actually. Oh. So And they came in quick succession. So uh, back in 2001, I believe 2001, 2002 season, Raiders had a very good team, Rich Gann and Tim Brown, uh, awesome, awesome group of guys. They played a team you might have heard about, uh, the New England Patriots mm. in the divisional round of the playoffs. Yeah. In the snow, uh, super cool game. I mean, very classic playoff game. Literally a just, cool game. Just feet yeah. of snow. They're having to clear it off during the game. Uh, it, it is a knockdown, drag out battle. And then the tuck rule happens. <laughs> right. Which, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, Tom Brady, the quarter- quarterback of the Patriots, gets sacked by a Raiders player. He fumbles. The Raiders recover, which you would think would set them up for right. victory. Right. But it turns but out... You would be wrong. The refs pulled out a very archaic rule from the rule book <laughs> called the Tuck Rule. And... Spoken like Patriots, a Raiders fan. <laughs> The Patriots continued on. They survived. They beat the Raiders on the last, uh, I think, an overtime field goal. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. That was yeah. pretty heartbreaking. And then, unfortunately, uh, I think it was the very next year, uh, the Raiders actually made it to the Super Bowl. They played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they got crushed, yeah. unfortunately. I think that was probably my lowest moment uh, as a Raiders fan, but uh, I would be remiss not to uh, ha- uh, have an opportunity to complain about the tuck rule yeah. on on air. See, ironically, the, the Raiders-Tampa Bay Super Bowl was one of my favorite. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> but the tuck rule thing, I, I was actually rooting for the Raiders already, you know, against the the— Oh, New England. New oh, England. I know. Sorry, New England So fans. annoying. Anyway, <laughs> Adam, 
What do you say? Well, I'm going to preemptively apologize to the people of the great state of Ohio. <laughs> um, <laughs> with that preamble out of the way, I hate Ohio State. Okay. <laughs> As an institution, not individuals. Well, you went uh, to Iowa. I did. Right? So I mean, that's... I, although, you know, yeah, I mean, so much hurt. <laughs> so so much, much hurt. hurt. And in Chuck Long's nearly perfect 1985 season as the quarterback of the Iowa Hawkeyes, uh, all was going quite swimmingly until they played Ohio State and lost. And that's when my right fist went through the wall <laughs> at home. <laughs> it's the only time I have ever physically pushed a part of my body through drywall before. But <laughs> I was so mad. I mean, how mad was I? I put my fist through the wall. <laughs> it was a shock to the wall, and it was a shock to me, and it was a shock to my parents. But um, it's a really bad moment. Yeah. I st- and to this day, my... We'll pick a kind, heady word. Antipathy. That's the word I'm going to go for. Oh, that's a nice My word. My antipathy for Ohio State uh, knows no bounds, except when they play like either Notre Dame or USC. And then you give them a pass. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm faced with the conundrum. <laughs> Can we just tie, right? <laughs> sure. Because I don't sure. want anybody to win. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. that's so, the answer. So did, uh, did your parents make you fix the wall? They did not. Okay. They did not. All right. Is yeah. there still a hole there? It would be kind of funny. I don't know. Was. I haven't lived there for about 35 years. You just yeah. wrote Ohio State. Yeah. yeah. Over it. <laughs> no, curse you, Ohio State. But it's a family show, so I'll stop there. We'll, we'll move on. All right. So I, I like Brett, am also going to cheat on my own question and give two answers. Oh, shocker. And so I do have to bring up the 1991 Denver Broncos Super Bowl against the San Francisco 49ers. Now, I by that time, I had been pretty used to watching my Denver Broncos get beaten in Super Bowls to that point. They had never won one, and they lost all of them very badly. But usually there was like a play that you could come up with a, a time during the game where you would think, oh, this is positive, this is good, and you can sort of take that home with you. There was nothing at all positive about the 55 to 10 beatdown. There was not no. one single second mm. that looked like the Broncos were doing anything. Yeah. It you was know, terrible. The people who, who came up with the saying, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, but how you play the game, <laughs> they were losers. Okay? It, no, that's just wrong. You don't think they I'm played sorry. sports? No, they didn't play sports. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so for my extra credit answer, I'm going to and go... And then we'll circle back to my extra credit answer. Okay. <laughs> so when when my when my daughter was young, you know, I, I am a big football fan, and I love to share things that I love with my children. So I took my child, my daughter, to a college football game, hoping against hope that she would really get into it. Sure. So I bought her Dippin' Dots just to sort of bribe her into coming. I sat her down. She seemed like she was going to give it a good college try, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> and so she sat Unfortunately, down. Unfortunately, it was an Air Force game, so it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we were, Sorry, we were watching. We were watching, actually, Air Force play Wyoming. Oh, see? There and, you go. And... I was trying to explain the rules to the game to her because she was asking good questions. And I was saying, okay, so you have like three turns right. to get the ball 10 yards down the field. And she turns to me and she says, well, what happens then? And I say, well, you go another 10 yards. And she just looked at me and she said, this is the dumbest game ever. And that was the end. She's never watched another football game. Does she Actually, like soccer? <laughs> she does like soccer. Because soccer seems pointless to me. Oh, my goodness. Any game that can That's... end in a 0-0 zero, zero score is a waste it's... of however much time it's un- it took it's to get un-American. there. That, that is, is not an American <laughs> game. That is totally a podcast for another time. It is. So my, since you guys each had bonus answers, when <laughs> Iowa got beat by South Carolina in the finals this year, oh, I don't think I've talked too much about our families shared love for Caitlin Clark. And now we watch every <laughs> Indiana Fever game and yep. we have the WNBA League Pass and we watch all of her games. But that was pretty crushing too. Yeah. Even though it was not wholly unexpected. 
That's become a pretty great rivalry, though, is Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, even in yeah. the going oh, into yeah. the WNBA. So that's pretty cool to see. Yep. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that, so that was... was a good. One. And so to wrap up our show today, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's interesting because we're we're clearly football fans here, right? Um, and according to Christianity Today, uh, football in part owes its popularity to Christianity. Really? Yes. So tell me more about that, Paul. So let me tell you, most Christian leaders hated it when it first became pretty popular. You know, right around the turn of the century, the 1910s, it was a pretty brutal sport to I was going to say, fair. was it the violence? That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, Wheaton College President Charles Blanchard around the turn of the century said the sport was savage and he threw it into the same immoral category as hard liquor and gambling. Whew. So he probably didn't play cards either. <laughs> he probably did not. <laughs> so in response, the leaders of, of football actually instituted a whole bunch of changes to the sport, including the forward pass. Wow. I think I think Teddy Roosevelt was pretty central to saving football, if I'm not mistaken, too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Really? Hmm. I need to hear more I about that. I think he that. had a voice in that, yeah. Well, Teddy Roosevelt had a voice in everything. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at those who play the game, uh, Christianity's influence is even more striking. And I know, Brett, you just did a blog about some, you know, you can't, you can't actually say, all of these players are Christian because the blog would go on for, you know. Right. A long time. <laughs> but you did pick out a few for this, for the blog that you wrote. Yes, Can I you did. tell us about a couple of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say it was it was difficult to, to pare down the list. I landed on eight players. Uh, that's that's because it's not a comprehensive list, as you mentioned. <laughs> uh, the list would go on and on. It's for a good reason. There are so many football players that are on fire for Jesus, so... That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. It was a good problem to have. Um, but I had to whittle things down. I got to eight. Here are a few from the blog. I'm not going to tell you all of them. So shameless plug. Uh, our listeners will have to go and actually read, <laughs> go the, read, read the, the blog. blog. Check it out. Uh, there are a lot of familiar faces on there, uh, but hopefully some that uh, maybe you don't know about. So a few on there that I want to touch on. Demario Davis. So Demario Davis is a linebacker for the New Orleans Saints. Mm -hmm. Now, if that name sounds familiar, uh, he actually went viral about a year ago uh, when he gave a post-game press conference that had nothing to do with football. Those he are always really great. Those are always really great. <laughs> this one especially. He stepped up to the podium. He actually has a daughter who suffers from epilepsy. Huh. And so they just had experienced a really scary moment with his daughter having... Uh, a, a bad, bad seizure. She had to go into the hospital. But Demario Davis uh, prayed uh, not just for healing from God, and he described this to the reporters after the game, but he prayed that his daughter would come out of it better than she was before wow. this had happened. And God answered that prayer. Mm. Wow. So he stepped up to the podium in, the, in this post-game conference, essentially just gave a five-minute sermon to the media. You can watch it. I would encourage everyone to check it out. And by the way, I'll say we'll link to some of these videos in the show notes mm. because hearing from the players themselves uh, is more impactful than than I could ever do justice in kind of telling mm. the story. So definitely go check that out. But Demario Davis, uh, I have a quote from him on from when he appeared on Colin Cowherd, which is a sports radio talk show. Uh, he's 35 years old, so he's one of the older, mm -hmm. especially linebackers in the league. Um, and he was Tough asked, life. he was asked, why is he still playing? So he said this, why am I still playing? It's because God is not done with what he's doing with me in the game yet. I'll play as long as he tells me to keep going because it's him that's extending my platform because he knows what I'm going to do with it. He knows every time I get in a seat like this, I'm going to give glory to my Lord and Savior, uh -huh. Jesus Christ. Mm. I'm going to say it because of him that I'm here. Wow, that's amazing. Really, really awesome. Really awesome. That is incredible. Are you guys familiar with Demario Davis? Or is that name? Was that No, little... honestly, I yeah. am not. Not yeah. before you started talking. Yeah. So that's really fascinating. And I am going to check out that press okay. conference. I All think right. that's awesome. Now here's, so I'll give you one more who is uh, maybe more of a name now. Mm -hmm. It's C.J. Stroud. Oh, so, yes, I've heard of Second CJ's year guy. quarterback. Well, he's a quarterback, right? Oh, Everyone man. hears about you know, quarterbacks, when, right? When quarterbacks for other teams are Christians, 
it just gets theologically complicated, <laughs> right? Rooting against them. Like, oh, oh, darn. I know, I know. But So C.J. Stroud, um, he, he burst onto the scene last year as a rookie, set a lot of uh, rookie records for his team, uh, passing yards, touchdowns. He just he played fantastic. And uh, he has also used his platform to give glory to God. So I've got a quote from him as well. He hasn't had an easy life. He's faced a lot of adversity growing up, but he's leaned into his faith. Uh, This is via the Athletes Corner Twitter. Uh, C.J. Stroud said at a press conference, Jesus Christ laid his life on the cross for us. I really believe that. This is bigger than just ball. And if I have to use football for my purpose to spread the gospel and the life of Jesus Christ, then I'll do that. And I think that's what God wants. Wow. That's great. So super... I didn't didn't know that about him. I I didn't either before I researched this. Um, So I I would really encourage people to check out the blog, uh, check out the videos, the links, uh, to just hear some of these athletes really profess their their faith in Christ in a in a powerful powerful way. You know, it's interesting as you're talking because as I'm thinking about the sport of football and yes, it is a game, right? But it requires so much dedication to do it well, to do it to an NFL level or even even really to a college level. It takes just so much sacrifice. Mm. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why why maybe there's there's a lot of Christians in there because because you dedicate yourself so much to this sport. Mm. It mirrors the dedication that maybe they feel in their own lives as they as they on their walk of 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 faith. I think that's absolutely true. And as I was thinking about this podcast today, I think that we can go back to scripture and we see that the Apostle Paul uses sports metaphors more than once. Mm-hmm. and and he basically, brings those in to talk about how athletes go into strict training. They go into, Mm. you know, dedicating their lives to something for the sake of winning a temporal crown. Mm -hmm. And and Paul uses that in contrast to what really matters. But I do think that those people who are hyper-disciplined, obviously not all of them, Mm -hmm. not everybody who's an elite athlete is a Christian I wonder if their dedication to sports, to, you know, not just football, but we're talking about football today, gives them an insight into pursuing what matters most Mm -hmm. with discipline, with purpose, with conviction. Um, Because I think that the the Christian life is one that it, it is a calling to discipline. It's a calling to lay down our own agenda Mm-hmm. And to embrace and to receive what God has for us, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, I wonder if just that dedication to to athletics and to sports and to football gives them some sort yeah. of uh, inner knowledge on on how the whole thing works. Well, it is it is interesting, right? I and I think it's something to to sort of ponder as as we talk about this because I, I when we talk about um, Christian movies. You know, you see a lot of directors, they seem to have picked up on some of that, that you're talking about, Adam, yeah. right? We sometimes joke that, like, half the Christian movies out there seem like they're based on football. On, on football. <laughs> you know? I've done a blog with a whole list of them, and it oh, wasn't even all of them. I know. It was, it was kind of telling. You know, when I, when I looked at the blog again, it, you know, before this podcast, it was like, 10 of the, right. the best <laughs> Christian football movies that are streaming right now. So you know that there's more than 10. A lot to choose right. from. Well, that was just Christian movies. That was just Christian movies. I mean, We're not even talking about, you know, Remember the Titans or some right. of these that you can pull in mm-hmm. that have these inspirational messages. But And you've reviewed almost all of these I, football I know. I, I sort of accidentally became the football guy. And... I think as somebody who wants to tell a Christian story, football provides a ready-made sort of construct, right? Mm -hmm. Because virtually all of these are underdog movies at at some level. Um, And and even the ones that aren't underdog movies, they manage to make them underdog movies, (laughs) right? And so it's about the struggle. It's about do I have what it takes? Can we overcome? Can we overcome a defeat? Can we keep a streak going? Can we win the biggest game? And so I think that there are so many of them because football becomes a metaphor for life, Mm -hmm. right? right? And the struggles that we face there. Well, and it it goes back to the the old Bible verse. I think when you're talking about, um, you know, 
three strands are not easily broken, right? right? Mm. And and when you're talking about that team, when I see these football movies, so much of it is about coming together as a team. Right. Yep. You support each other. You sacrifice for each other. You you share one another's burdens. And that's a really powerful message, I think, whether you're a football fan or not. Right. So, Adam, just out of curiosity, do you have a favorite Christian football movie? Well, I think my favorite is probably American Underdog, but it's a little bit of a cheat, mm, yeah, right? That's interesting. Uh, this is obviously the Kurt Warner story. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago. It's a cheat because Kurt Warner went to you and I, uh, the University <laughs> of Northern <laughs> Iowa. There so there's another <laughs> Iowa connection there. Everything um, goes back to Iowa. Right? That's right. <laughs> he wants the short Iowa. version is he wants to play pro football. He mm-hmm. does everything he can. He gets cut before he even really gets a chance. And then circumstances uh, are such that he ends up back on uh, the St. Louis Rams at that point. And their quarterback, who is now lost in the midst of time, you probably know who it is. Trent Green. Thank you. Um, <laughs> see, this is why I can do this podcast, because others have my back. Thank you, Brett. Um, he gets hurt in what yeah. the opening game or preseason? I think it was the preseason. It was preseason. Yep. And they put Kurt Warner in, and everybody's like holding their breath. Right. 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 And How the, good does a team usually do in the backup quarterback? Exactly. Has to come in. Exactly. And and he walks in, and it's one of the greatest football seasons of all time. Yeah. You know, they called it the greatest show on turf, and we watch his faith play out um, to some extent. Um, this is an Irwin Brothers movie, mm-hmm. and they tend to tell true stories about people of faith, but it isn't necessarily like, you know, there's an altar call at the end of it. It we, feels very organic. It how feels they deal very with organic. Faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was really well done. So I'll vote for American Underdog. Yeah. So let me ask both of you this question. I know that there are probably one or two listeners who don't really care for football, sure. and they're listening to this and conversation. We'll pray for them. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter, right. goodness. But but when you're talking about these these football movies, are there things that non-football fans can draw from these movies? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that this is stepping out of the, the specifically Christian football movie space, but I think of a movie like Rudy. Mm-hmm. Right, which is a story, I mean, talk about an underdog story of someone just fighting tooth and nail first to, to get into Notre Dame. Right, right. So, it's a walk on at Notre Dame. Yes, right? and normally the famous... they didn't take hobbits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's our Lord of the Rings. Sean Astin, Sean Astin was yes. starting yes. that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the first part of, of that movie is about him trying to kind of break out of uh, this this little kind of small town bubble that that he just feels he needs to get out of, and mm-hmm. and he sees the way to do that is he wants to go to school at Notre Dame, mm-hmm. and there is so much that goes into him just working, 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 grinding to try to just get into the school, and then after he accomplishes that, then it's okay now I want to play on the, the <laughs> Notre Dame football team, <laughs> setting his sights high, but he gets on the practice squad, everything, but just. It's just an inspirational story of just never giving up and just really pressing into a goal. And I think that anyone mm-hmm. could, could appreciate that type of story. Yeah. And in the end, when he drops the football in the fires of Mount Doom. <laughs> oh, it's my so, goodness. It's such a tearjerker. Adam, yeah. We're so yeah. happy you're back. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, seriously, back to your question. All of these stories are typically set in a bigger context, right? They're set in a context of relationship. They're set in a context of overcoming challenges. Um, A number of the ones that I had on my blog uh, that we published last year have to do with racism. Mm. You know, we could talk about The Blind Side. We can talk about Woodlawn, Mm -hmm. which is an early Irwin Brothers movie set in Alabama in 1973. And pretty good. Mm. And really good. Mm -hmm. It's a really good movie. check that one out. And it's a story about um, integration Mm. of, of whites and blacks on the high school football team. And so in some ways, with stories like these, we're getting a bigger narrative, mm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a number of, t- of movies deal with, you know, people who are coming from poverty. So they're trying to overcome life circumstances yeah. that are really difficult. Greater has to do with Brandon Bullsworth, who fights very, very hard to become a walk-on at Arkansas right. 
uh, and then he's killed in a tragic accident. And it really is about grief and loss. And so I think almost all of them, football is sort of the crucible for the plot. Yeah. But there mm-hmm. are these human stories that inform those those stories. Well, and that's one of the things that I love about these movies, right? And, and I, I think as football fans, we can appreciate that. Because I don't know about you guys, but I do... After the Broncos win, I feel a certain way. After the Broncos good. lose, there's a I certain feel good. way. It feels, <laughs> it feels, it, it does feel like it's a big deal, right? And and when mm-hmm. I come in on Monday morning, my mood is totally impacted by yep. that. But then, as as fans, we also remember the real stories behind these athletes here. Yep. We know the struggles that they came through to get to where they are. We know sometimes the struggles that they're still dealing with. There are these these fifty three very human stories that mm-hmm. are part of every single football team. Good point. And those can be incredibly inspiring, incredibly convicting. I think that there's also something about hope mm. in play here. Mm. Like you can't be a fan of something without investing emotionally, right? And that emotional investment comes with risk. Mm, yeah. Because there's no guarantee especially if you're a Broncos or Raiders fan, <laughs> that the outcome is going to make you happy, right? Okay, recently, sorry. Right, yeah, that's um, and so you're invested emotionally in this outcome. And I do think that there's something about hope that translates again back to our faith, mm-hmm. that, that we have hope and faith in a God who lived for us, who died for us, that we might live lives of purpose but sometimes we run into, you know, buzz saws in life. And what does it look like to continue to have hope when we lose the proverbial big game in yeah. our lives? Too? Right. And I right. think these movies speak to that. Yeah, I love that thought. Yeah, my, my dad would always tell me that sports is a microcosm of life. Yep. And I, I really do think that that rings true to both of your points. Mm. Sports and, and football, I mean, it allows us to see people in intense situations, great athletes, but how they handle an extraordinary amount of pressure in the moment reveals a lot about who they are and their their character. And I think that creates a lot of drama that we're drawn to watch. Yeah, yeah, I love that thought. And as we bring this conversation in for a landing, a reminder, football is a violent sport. It's not quite as brutal as it was back at, you know, at the turn of the last century, but but we call out violence in every single one of these movies. So if that's an issue for your family, as we talk about this, these films, be sure to check out the full plugged in review. But I love these thoughts as far as as far as this crucible of life, right? So thanks so much for that great game conversation. And for Yay. those of you who are listening, I'd like to encourage you to take the field in another sort of game. Aha. One that you can win. And what is that game, you ask? Media discernment. Yes, that's right. Lined up against you are Hollywood's fearsome offensive linemen, and I do mean offensive. They're ready to heave problematic content into your end zone and do annoying touchdown dances on your family's logo. But how can you guard against entertainment's end rounds? How can you screen out its screen passes? by getting your very own defensive playbook. And by that, I mean, of course, becoming a screen-savvy family. Ooh, I see what you did there. I, I was proud of that. <laughs> That's right. This book gives you tactics you can employ with you and your own family. You've got the talent on your team already. All you need is a plan. Every page comes with tactics on how to deal with entertainment and technology. Mm. You don't need to even buy a game ticket to get it. All you need is to give us a gift of any amount to intercept one of these fine books and scamper to the end zone. Go to the Plugged In Show homepage to find out how. Ten years ago, the original God's Not Dead film came out, and the film became a surprise hit at the box office, eventually earning nearly $65 million. A decade later, the God's Not Dead franchise is still alive and kicking. The latest God's Not Dead in God We Trust continues to give its fans all the content they've come to expect. Evil atheists, principled Christians, and impassioned speeches about religious freedom and authority. But this one comes with a few interesting wrinkles, as I saw. Um, Before we get to the newest one, though, Adam, you are probably the most familiar person on our staff with this franchise. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of the whole vibe of the God's Not Dead series 
Yeah, I mean, the whole vibe really has to do with freedom to practice our faith without interference from the government. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's really been the story of the overarching franchise. And as you said, you talked about evil atheists. I would say perhaps more than any other Christian franchise, there's kind of an us versus them vibe. Mm. And one of the, I guess I'll call it a criticism. I'm Mm -hmm. not trying to throw it under the bus, but I think one of the criticisms that we have had is that, you know, we get these, these characters who feel often very two dimensional on the other side. Um, You know, they're the, yeah, they're the megalomaniacs that are tying the damsel down on the train tracks. Right. right. Um, And, and they have, sort of that lack of complexity um, sometimes. And and then we get Christians who are interacting with them, whether that's in court, whether that's in school. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different contexts, whether that's on the university campus. Um, and and we watch as they try to, to deal with that. Now, I will say, I think the last couple, there has been a bit more nuance. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the first one, there's this guy who's the atheist who you know, is absolutely a two-dimensional character. And he was played by Kevin Sorbo, right? He's played by Kevin Sorbo. You know, he gets hit by a car and has a come-to-Jesus moment as he's dying on the road at the end of the movie. And I'm just like, okay. I mean, it just... <laughs> I had a hard time with it. Mm-hmm. Now, I think these movies appeal taps into the fact that a lot of us as Christians feel like what we believe is under assault from Mm -hmm. every direction, from Hollywood, from the government, from the culture at large, from the media. And there is a sense that we want somebody to articulate our side of the story. Right. 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 And and so I think this whole franchise really does that in a melodramatic way Mm -hmm. um, that I understand why people like it. It's like, finally, somebody is speaking out for us and standing up for for it's, faith in the public square. It's planting the Christian flag Absolutely. in the culture, right? Um, but I do think it has an us versus them sort of mindset that I personally have wrestled with as I've watched these movies. They can be a little bit tricky. And I think especially from the from the seat where we sit, where we see so many movies, yeah. where we have come to expect, you know, some nuanced complexity from the really good ones, right? Yep. Um, the You're right. I think that, that what we see from the God's Not Dead movies can feel a little bit two-dimensional. Um, the the characters and, and the, the opposing characters can feel a little like straw men. Right. You know, they are there to be knocked down. Right. But as you say, there is a place for that. Right. And there is a huge appeal for that. Well, and I'll also say that actor David A.R. White, who plays Pastor David Hill, he has been involved making Christian movies and Christian media his entire life. And and I think that there is a place for asking the question, how do we tell these sorts of stories? And I think his character... Mm is is one that has a kind of complexity to it that maybe is lacking sometimes with the characters that are opposing yeah. him. So I don't want to say that there is nothing of value here, but I think when people talk about some of the concerns we have with Christian movies, these are some of the ones that come up for me. When you talk about David A.R. White, who plays Reverend Hill in, in this particular movie, he's been a part of all of these movies. Yep. You can, I think, you can sort of see his growth, actually, I as think so both too. an actor and as a character totally. throughout these movies. Um, you know, the the fifth one, he comes across as, as pretty multidimensional. He is still, and, and this is really a, a delight to see in some ways, he, he does present himself as a thoughtful, well-spoken, but very principled Christian yep. throughout this entire thing. But you see you see moments of humanity within him that, that I found to be sort of disarming. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask, I, I think that that's a really cool uh, element that franchises can bring is when you, you've mm-hmm. seen a character develop over time and become more multidimensional, the, the audience kind of yeah. gets to grow with that. So he served a supporting role in all of the other films? Is this his first starring He's, kind of protagonist role? No, no, he he is really the protagonist for most of them. Now, sometimes he steps back into more of a supporting role, but but in this film, he is definitely the protagonist. Okay. What, what is set up in in 
in God We Trust is this political contest. Uh, the, there's a congressman who has unexpectedly died. His opponent, uh, Kane, his last name is, he uh, huh, that's is, interesting. He is a militant, militant <laughs> atheist who wants to bring um, secularism very much into the public square and push religion out. Like he was in a, in a previous God's Not Dead movie uh, as, as sort of this, this lawyer who is fighting, I think, in sort of this schoolroom, courtroom yep. type of setting. Mm. So he is the opponent. He is running unopposed until the opposition decides, oh, this Reverend Hill, he can actually maybe step into the role, give this guy a little bit of a contest. So that's sort of where this begins. So he is at the center of this story throughout the entire movie. Okay. Well, I think that one of the things that this entire franchise does is it, it really presents us with the question of what does it look like to defend our faith mm-hmm. in the public square? Mm-hmm. And on one hand, you know, I'd, I'd mentioned some criticisms earlier. On the other hand, I think a lot of us would do well to be prodded to recognize there's an enormous, um, there's an enormous amount of stuff at stake here. Right, right. right? And that if we all just sort of roll over, um, we're going to have to deal with more of this. So I think I've had to wrestle with what is my responsibility as a Christian in terms of participating in, in our democracy. And I think these films mm. raise that question. Yeah, and, and this this latest film probably does that to the greatest extent that I have personally seen. Um, and that was gratifying in a lot yeah. of ways. Let, let me just say, I am not... A, a culture warrior. I, when I this this connection between politics and religion can make me a little bit queasy, and so I went into this movie with trepidation. Right, I would you say you were trepidatious. I was trepidatious, <laughs> but but when you look into the themes that this movie is bringing to the forefront, the idea that as Christians we need to bring our faith into the public square, that it needs to impact every area of our lives. I think that's a true and important message, mm. you know, because if we are Christians, our faith, God, Jesus, they mold every area of our lives. We are shaped by Jesus. Right. And to say, okay, so I'm not going to bring my faith into the public square, that just doesn't make sense from yeah, a Christian Yeah, we're retreating. Point of view. Right, yeah. And there's a lack of integration there, potentially. Right, so so when you're talking about about this this man running for Congress, the idea that his faith wouldn't impact his his ideas, right. his positions, I I resonated with that. Well, and I I've, when I found David Hill as a character to be pretty nuanced and pretty complex in ways that perhaps some of his opponents aren't. Mm-hmm. We have really watched him over the course of five films now grapple with faith issues on a lot of levels. So, um, Paul, you saw the movie. You can speak to whether that continues to happen. It sounds like it does. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But I do appreciate that about the franchise. I'm also wondering for anybody who might be interested in this, are there any content concerns or things that families would need to be aware of before this one. I'm not imagining this is a long list, but I am curious. Uh, yeah, so we do have an element of of a child born out of wedlock, essentially. Uh, so you do have those issues. You have some, uh, just some bad behavior on the part yeah. of, of the reverend's uh, opponents. You know, you just have to deal with that. But but this is a God's Not Dead movie. The the content issues, it is a Christian movie, so the content issues are not very extreme at all. It's pretty navigable if you can if you can sort of navigate the the purpose and the premise of the film. So yeah, it's it's a fascinating franchise, really, when you look at it in its totality. And it, it definitely has become sort of one of probably the most recognizable franchises within the Christian movie sphere. Yeah. So I think we're going to be seeing a God's Not Dead 6 okay. before long. Well, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Plugged In Show. And we especially thank those non-football fans out there who stuck with us this entire time. And now, whether you like football or not, we'd love for you to join in the conversation. What do you think about football? Do you have a favorite Christian player you root for, even if he's playing for the wrong team? Brett? Come on. Are you going to see the latest God's Not Dead movie? Throw us an email at at theplugginshow.com. 
Offer a voicemail audible on the Plugged In Show homepage. Talk to us on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, tell your friends about us and invite them to listen in. And then join us again in about a week's time, if you would, when we queue up a conversation about Transformers 1 on the Plugged In Show. More than meets the eye. They are more than meets the eye. (laughs) (laughs) 